What I'd like to do is to, uh, to deal with the sort of challenge that Stephen throws up, which is, you know, how the UK should respond uh, to the world uh, turned upside down, uh, and look at perhaps some of the competing visions that where Britain's place in the world might go. But also to, uh, to look at the EU, because the EU, uh, uh, again, as Stephen has indicated, is the key. And even uh, Brexiting uh, or not, uh, the European Union is going to be the key sort of central foreign policy challenge for the UK uh, for, uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. We face, uh, I think, an unparalleled moment uh, in British uh, foreign policy. Uh, we have, I think, simultaneously what are called a hardware and a software challenge. Uh, those of you who've got uh, computers will know it's not a good idea to change the software. Sometimes problematic to change the hardware. Doing both at once is not a good thing uh, to do, and in fact looks foolhardy. We're changing the hardware because we're changing the structures and the instruments, the ways that we do foreign policy. A key instrument for us in our foreign policy since '73 has been being plugged in uh, to the European Union. But we're also really engaging, and Stephen's pamphlet is a part of that, I think, uh, a debate about the ideas, the ambitions, the interests, the software that actually drive uh, Britain's understanding of Britain's place in the world uh, and our aspirations uh, for uh, the UK. Uh, and, and I want to talk uh, probably more about the software than I will about the, uh, the hardware. If we think back, and Stephen does a very good job, and I think an important job, of sort of locating uh, Britain's place in the world uh, against a sort of unfolding uh, context uh, post uh, Second World War. And it's a context in which Britain has been through several major order structural challenges, which it has coped with. We might say it's coped with reasonably successfully. It coped with the Cold War. It coped with uh, a sort of post-imperial uh, identity for the UK. It, it coped with the move towards a post-Cold uh, War period. But all of those were essentially adjustments to the United States rather than adjustments by the United Kingdom. So I think this moment is different and represents a different uh, order uh, challenge. And at the moment, we're operating under this hashtag, uh, Global Britain, which probably hasn't yet got enough content to fill the requisite number of characters for a tweet. Uh, but I'm sure uh, we will get there uh, in, uh, in, due, uh, in due course, because it's a debate that we have to have. But what really encapsulates the problem we have is uh, a problem not from Alice in Wonderland uh, and, uh, and from Lewis Carroll, but uh, a problem we have uh, that I would suggest was, was sort of or characterized in my mind by Hugh Lofting. And you may be familiar with Hugh Lofting as the author of the, the Dr. Doolittle uh, series uh, of books made into a fantastic 1967 film. And there is a, an animal uh, in that, the, the push me pull you the llama, the two-headed llama. Uh, and that's really what Britain's foreign policy has been since uh, 1945. We have tried to combine uh, our relationship with Europe and our relationship with the United States in a very closely coupled uh, fashion, uh, sometimes pulling in one direction, sometimes pulling in the other, but trying absolutely resolutely to uh, retain the two things uh, stitched together. We are possibly now marching that off to the knacker's yard. Uh, so where are we going to be uh, without the, the push me, uh, uh, the push me, pull you? Well, there has already been the articulation of the idea, as is always the case, and is almost the golden rule of discussions uh, about British foreign policy that we need to go, to go back to Churchill's first principles, which is think about the idea uh, of the UK uh, having a policy towards a united Europe a policy towards, uh, uh, as Churchill articulated, articulated the British Empire and the Commonwealth, uh, and a policy towards the English-speaking world, and to sit somewhere uh, between uh, those through. There, so there is a, already a kind of back to the future element of some of the discussion that we're having about Britain's place in the world. And many of you here will have read ideas that, for example, the UK uh, should seek to build on its intelligence sharing relationship with Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand to enter into early uh, early uh, trade agreements with those countries uh, because uh, they have a kind of cultural uh, and constitutional understanding of the UK. And by the way, uh, we would then represent a sort of formidable uh, grouping in terms of our economies and in terms of our geopolitical uh, footprint. So as I say, there's already a sort of back to the future uh, aspect to some of the debate. There is, and I think uh, uh, Theresa May's visit to, to Washington demonstrate this, there is still 
uh, the appeal of the idea of the UK as the indispensable partner uh, to the United States, which has uh, been an important idea uh, in British uh, thinking uh, since the Second World War, obviously, and we've been connecting in all sorts of ways uh, in security uh, and intelligence uh, terms that uh, Stevens uh, touched on. I think there is, and there will inevitably be, a temptation uh, to think in terms of the UK as really now a, a middle power. Uh, a middle power that doesn't seek to, to amplify uh, its place in the world or uh, amplify a message about its place in the world through the European Union, which has essentially been the strategy for the UK uh, since uh, 1973. And I think where I would depart with Stephen's uh, analysis is I think that it is the least likely proposition uh, that the UK uh, will connect to the European Union in membership uh, type terms, but what I think is absolutely essential for uh, the future of Britain's foreign uh, and security policy is to engage in a strategic partnership with the European Union. A partnership which is about the economy, which is about people, and is about security. And I think after, once we get beyond the sort of short-term uh, bump uh, in the road, where that's a very large bump, very large speed bump, uh, of uh, the negotiation that sanity should prevail uh, because the relationship will be uh, too important to be one uh, that, uh, that ends up in a sort of irrec uh, irreconcilable uh, divorce. But I think uh, that's a sort of medium and long-term aspiration rather than something uh, that can be seen in the short term. And one of the reasons why that will be essential for the UK is the sort of hardware problem that the UK faces. That Britain has a formidable array of instruments for the conduct of its foreign uh, security uh, and defence policy. The problem is that we don't have enough of them uh, and we're uh, pretty unlikely to be able to afford everything that we might want to have uh, to sustain the kind of influence that we hope we might have outside the European Union. We've cut our spending on diplomacy double digit year on year. We've also decanted uh, uh, over 25% over of foreign office staff into DEXIU, the Department of the European Union. So we're fiddling around uh, with bits of the plumbing uh, at a time uh, when we really should be focusing a bit on how the water flows rather than uh, sending the water in all sorts of odd directions. We've already given up on what has been a key uh, uh, selling proposition of the UK post-1945 is we build institutions, we build regimes internationally, and we're about to leave a very successful institution and a very successful regime. We've got to think quite hard about how we sell uh, to third countries the idea that Britain is still sort of committed uh, to building uh, institutions uh, and regimes. But there are other interesting things uh, going on, uh, I think, that shouldn't leave us in entirely uh, pessimistic. I think there is a sort of retooling of Britain's, uh, foreign, uh, uh, Britain's uh, military uh, and security capability. Uh, Britain at this moment is going east of Suez in terms of basing, you know, having new bases uh, in uh, the Middle East and we'll be having uh, aircraft uh, carriers that will be uh, primarily deployed in the east. The problem there, of course, is we built them in a way that doesn't allow us to fly uh, French uh, aircraft uh, from them and only US aircraft and US aircraft of a variant which is somewhat vulnerable uh, to Donald Trump on a bad day in terms of a defence uh, cut, the F-35B, which is this short takeoff variant that the Marine Corps is buying. Um, but for me, uh, uh, if you look at other aspects of Britain's soft power, its development aid, uh, and so on, uh, and so on, uh, these are positives, but they all hang in the balance in terms of the political uh, economy question. And as Stephen has quite rightly pointed, pointed out, I think one of the more influ influential aspects of Britain uh, in recent years, it's been its uh, centrality uh, within uh, the global political economy because of the City of London, and losing that or any questioning of that does uh, uh, have a diminution in Britain's uh, influence uh, internationally. And perhaps that's something that we haven't reflected upon when we've just focused on uh, jobs and so on and so on. So how are we going to sort of re-articulate ideas about uh, our place in the world? Well, we have a national security strategy, we have a strategic defence and security review, we have de uh, development plans for the Foreign Office uh, and DFID. Um, all of those are important, uh, and we haven't even started to think about uh, how we might uh, rewrite those to cope with our new circumstances. And the most important moment, uh, I think, uh, for all of those, and indeed uh, for Britain's place in the world, starts not, uh, not at the beginning of March, or possibly a bit later, 
and the invocation of, uh, of Article 50, but will be when the Chancellor stands up uh, and delivers his budget, because the key determinant of our ambitions uh, for the next uh, few years depends very much on the ability of government uh, to continue spending uh, on foreign policy. And I would say that based on what we've seen in the last few years, the omens are not good, uh, frankly, because it's been an area uh, in which uh, cost cutting uh, has been very, uh, very easy, uh, because there aren't many people who stand up uh, and uh, defend uh, the Foreign Office. Let me just say uh, in a couple of minutes before I finish, uh, uh, why uh, I think the UK uh, is going to have uh, an EU uh, preoccupation and the EU is going to be sort of front and centre in terms of uh, thinking about Britain's place in the world. Well, the obvious one, of course, is because of the negotiations uh, with the other uh, member states, the exit negotiation, the transition agreement negotiation, the successor trade uh, agreement negotiation, negotiations on foreign uh, and security policy, as well as the trade negotiations to replace the trade policy, the policy that we currently have uh, with uh, the European Union. But we also have to make a determination as to what kind of European diplomacy we, we actually want. What kind of relationship uh, does the UK want to have uh, with uh, the European Union? We've moved from a position in which we sought to be a member but to opt out. I think we moved uh, uh, then into a position in which we wanted to be uh, the best uh, of those who are outside the core, not part of the monetary union. We've moved very quickly, almost in a matter of weeks, from a position in which we had the perspective uh, of leading the sort of EEA, EFTA type uh, group of countries. We've ruled that out. I think now probably we're somewhere where we're looking for uh, leadership of the confederacy uh, of Europe, and there are obviously not many confederate states uh, in terms of those who are outside the EU. But also I think more likely uh, we're about to fall into a period uh, of what one of my colleagues has called promiscuous bilateralism. We're going to be very tempted uh, to do our utmost to make mischief uh, by being uh, promiscuous diplomatically. And, and perhaps this is, this is a sort of cautionary uh, for, uh, for, uh, for us to think about where our diplomatic strategy is going to go. Inevitably, our attitude towards the European Union will shift uh, as a non-member. As a member and during the transition period, while we're on the in, uh, we will be very enthusiastic about the single market. We'll be very enthusiastic about EU uh, trade policy. Once we leave, we're going to be much more ambivalent about the single market. It will be a barrier to trade for the UK. We will want to see the single market, um, uh, or we will perhaps increasingly see the single market something that gets in the way of opportunity rather than facilitates. Ditto on international trade. The UK will take quite a different position, I think, on the European Union and will start possibly to characterise uh, the European Union is a barrier uh, to free trade rather than a facilitator uh, once on the outside. And even key areas uh, for Britain where we've been consistent, irrespective of what government we've had in power, Tory or Labour, like enlargement policy, again, you can imagine that Britain might shift and be much more ambivalent of questions of enlargement because, of course, enlargement increases the capacity uh, for influence uh, by uh, the European uh, Union within Europe. So where uh, does that uh, leave the UK? Well, I think we have a, we have a two, uh, two union uh, challenge. We have the challenge of dealing with the European Union because dealing with the European Union will largely determine what we can do beyond uh, the European Union because it's going to be so preoccupied. But what actually may be the most important determinant of how far we deal with the European Union is how we deal with our own union, uh, the United Kingdom. Because we haven't even embarked on the process of working out how are we going to address the issue of how we reconcile the collective negotiating position of the United Kingdom, where we have quite different views in Belfast, Edinburgh, uh, and uh, Cardiff. But also at the same time, how will we accommodate uh, the need that we have uh, to address where we repatriate powers to uh, when uh, they come back to the UK from the European Union? Devolution happened post-1973. In the devolution settlements, we uh, wrote uh, a whole series of powers in uh, for the devolved governments, agriculture uh, and environment being a couple of examples. And there are questions then, and I think a tussle to be had, about the degree uh, to which those powers, or the extent to which those powers, particularly for Scotland, uh, are uh, given to Scotland because they will be demanded. And absolutely crucially, uh, the, horses, the resources that will flow uh, from Westminster to the devolved uh, to get hold of them. And why I'm uh, sort of pessimistic 
about our uh, capacity uh, to, uh, uh, to sort of cope uh, with the double union challenges because one of the things that we've lost we've lost through the, uh, the Brexit debate is essentially uh, the consensus that existed amongst our political and security elite about uh, Britain's place in the world. Parliament uh, is cleaved. I think uh, uh, Whitehall uh, is in shock uh, and the public uh, remains uh, divided. I mean, not least uh, because we're not really having a decent uh, public debate about what should replace uh, the uh, uh, the organisation that we're leaving, uh, which has been so sort of centering uh, for understanding Britain's place in the world. So, thank you uh, very much, uh, Stephen, uh, for uh, provoking. I think you've given us a sort of double caffeine shot uh, of uh, uh, ideas, uh, and I and I know that this all uh, this debate and certainly response to your pamphlet will run and run. So, thanks very much. <laughs>